Okay. So probably what you really want to get to here then is, is what are the physical storage options, right? We talked about conceptually, uh, you know, storage temporality. We talked about conceptual query temporality and about the different, uh, you know, API strategies. So for these types of temporality that we've been talking about, what are the physical options for, for implementing them that people may use? So uh, non-temporal storage, right? Really, the, the only option here to think about is, is you have a, uh, a table which essentially has no date time as part of the key, okay? So this is called the no date time you know, approach to non-temporal storage, and again, there really is no alternative. For valid temporal storage, okay, there is an alternative. You can implement valid temporal storage by having a single valid start timestamp, or you can implement it by having a valid start and a valid end. Right. So how would it work if you just had a simple valid start timestamp? What would the valid end be? It would be the valid start of the next, of the next one. Right? Okay. So that's the, the two alternatives there. The same kind of scenario exists for transaction temporal storage. Right? That we can have the one timestamp approach just having the transaction start and then the end you know, of that uh, value would be when we get the trans start of the next, the next value of trans start. Or we can have a period where you have trans start and trans end. Um, interesting thing to think about with these guys is to start thinking about candidate keys for when you have uh, these approaches. So the candidate key, for example, just to get you, uh, you know, thinking a little bit here, for the two timestamp valid temporal or the two timestamp transaction temporal, the, uh, the, the uh, candidate key, well, it needs to be the time period of the transaction start and the transaction end can't overlap with the, the period of any other, right? So it's a complex, uh, you know, primary key constraint which is needed there, right? And this is one of the things that we're going to get to in a little bit is that there is new uh, extensions to uh, ANSI and ISO SQL which are in the process of being approved right now and having that type of constraint become available for the first time is one of the things which is in this new ANSI ISO SQL standard. Okay, to be able to handle this type of thing, you know, within the DBMS engine. Now, those are probably, you know, pretty straightforward, you know, to get your, your head around as far as, you know, how that translates into, um, you know, tables. Uh, it gets a little bit more complicated when we get to bitemporal storage. But again, there's, uh, now there's four different types of, uh, of approaches that we can do towards physical storage of this type of data. One is we can just have two timestamps a transaction start and a valid start, okay? The other permutation here is, is that we can have a transaction start and a valid start and a valid end. So you have the time period for the valid data, but you just have the single timestamp for the transaction dimension of time. Or you can flip that around for another approach for, uh, for three time stamping. And I do have to say, I, I didn't used to have this one on the uh, slide, but I got to, you know, prompted on the, uh, the grounds of that it was a theoretical uh, possibility. I really have never seen any implementation of this, uh, this possibility. This, this is actually used a fair amount in, uh, in data warehousing. So if you, uh, you know, hang around with the Kimball dimensional modelers at all, um, whenever they support bitemporal data, that's probably the approach that they're going to be uh, using. And then lastly, there's the, uh, the four timestamp approach. And the four timestamp approach is actually is what is being used in the new ANSI ISO SQL uh, standard, which is uh, in the process of, uh, of being approved and published right now. Okay, so this is, uh, you know, what the standard is based upon. And we talked about the, the candidate keys. So what's interesting here is that the, uh, the key for this approach is a combination of non-overlapping periods, transaction periods, and non-overlapping valid periods. So using this approach, it's okay to have two rows out there with overlapping transaction periods. It's okay to have rows out here with overlapping valid periods. But it's not okay to have them both overlapping, to have a row where both of them overlap. So this, this next slide here, uh, we're beginning to drill down a little bit more, and I'm beginning to drill down in the, uh, in the bitemporal uh, data storage options because, you know, I think the other ones were a little bit easier for us to grasp, okay? And so now we're going to drill down here on the, uh, the three main bitemporal uh, storage uh, options, and I left that uh, theoretical possibility off here. And so um, I'm going to go back to when we first talked about the example, and I, I mentioned that this example was a, a state-based example, 
right? It was state-based inputs coming in, okay? So as it turns out, it's a very important, it really matters a lot whether your inputs coming in are, are state-based or whether they're event-based on how much work it is to do in processing those events uh, depending upon which of the different storage options you choose, okay? So if you have event-based inputs and you use the two timestamp approach, it turns out that you can insert the data into your database very, very easily. In fact, you don't even need to read the database in order to be able to store this information using that approach, okay? It turns out, though, that if you have state-based inputs, it's very complicated for that approach, okay? You have to read the database, and you may have to do multiple uh, inserts in order to do it. And also, as it turns out, that if you want to do our simple query, our type 6 query, which is the uh, uh, discrete uh, valid timestamp and discrete transaction timestamp as an input, it's a very complicated query to, uh, to return that. You have to do two combinations of max and less than in order to be able to fulfill that one simple query. And I'm going to show you in the next slide at Alex uh, prompting uh, the, the actual SQL to do that query, though. Okay. Um, for the three timestamp approach, if you have event-based inputs, okay, you have to read the database, but it's not, uh, it's not too bad. And for state-based inputs, you don't need to read the database. You can just put the data uh, right in. It works pretty well. For the four timestamp approach, you need to read the database and do some updates okay, for event-based inputs and kind of the same thing for state-based inputs. But, so here you're paying the penalty on insert, okay, but you're reaping the benefit on read okay, because now you don't need to do these combinations of max and less than. Okay? You can just you know, kind of constrain between uh, two values. Okay? So the read performance is much better. And so you know, I think that's kind of a good hint why they chose this approach for the upcoming uh, ANSI ISO temporal extensions. Okay. I hope you will be able to read this next slide here. It's not so bad, is it? Okay. So now, now what I'm going to do is I, I can't do this for all of the, the cells here, but there's a story behind each one of these six cells, right? We could spend a, a good slide or, or, or more on each one of these cells. I'm just going to drill down on a couple of them, okay? So here we're drilling down on the three timestamp approach, state-based inputs, and the query to fill that type 6 query, okay? So here you have a simple uh, customer table with, uh, would you believe it, a credit rating attribute, okay? We have three timestamp approach, so we have the, uh, the valid begin and the valid end and the transaction begin, okay? The ID, you could think of this as being a type two surrogate key if you wanted to, or it's just it's the unique surrogate key for every row in that table. Pretty simple scenario. Uh, the key ID is a natural key, if you will, okay? So pretty simple layout to this table. Here is the, uh, the data that we're going to put into that table. And again, this is an in inclusive, exclusive format. I warned you about that, that you know, typically you know, people uh, physically store the data in, in this format. Um, and let me see what else here. So because this is three timestamp approach, state-based inputs, the processing to store this information is just to insert this data just like this. Okay, it's very simple. And so you know, there is our example. Okay, St you know, uh, storing, being stored as state-based inputs. No transformation necessary. We said that the credit rating was A all day on the third, all day on the fourth, and not on the fifth. Oh, okay. because, because it's inclusive, exclusive, okay. right? And so the reason why people like to do this when they're physically storing the data is that if you're looking for those contiguous time periods that I was talking about, when you do it this way, the end of one period can equal the beginning of another period, right? If you do it inclusive, inclusive, right, then the, next, then the next time period has to be one clock tick greater than the period that you just did, right? But the problem with that and why that gets messy is, is what is a clock tick, right? Okay, so that's why when people physically store it, they like to do it in this inclusive, exclusive format. But what's interesting is, is that you know, what's most natural for, for people when you talk about it, you don't say, you know, uh, I was at my aunt's last, uh, you know, Tuesday to Wednesday, meaning that I was there on Monday and Tuesday, right? So we typically talk about events in inclusive, inclusive format, but we like to store data in databases in inclusive, exclusive format. 
Um, so, uh, you know, because this is state-based inputs and it's the, the three-time stamp approach, it's uh, inserting data into our table is like, uh, you know, a hot knife through butter. Um, we just insert in this data. And so our type 6 query, uh, again, uh, here's some code, Microsoft Access code, right? That's as close as I could come to Microsoft SQL Server code, okay? Uh, the, uh, the little brackets are prompts. And you can see here the example, and so I, I lied before. I, I, this isn't the two time stamp approach, so I don't have the two uh, maxes and less than combinations, but I have the single max than and less than combination. So what are we doing? We have the valid periods, right? So we just need, it's a simple constraint to get the valid period that you're looking for, okay? But for the transaction period, we just have the transaction start. So when I input in that discrete transaction start that I want, okay, I want the row which has a transaction start less than my input parameter, right? I want a row that, has, that is less than that input parameter, but which one of those rows do I want? The max, right? So that's why you need the combination of the max and the less than in order to retrieve the, uh, the query. Was that technical enough? Did I get down to enough? I don't have any more code. This is it, so I hope that does it for you. <laughs> um, okay. So uh, one other cell in that uh, matrix that I, I thought was you know, important enough to try to cover a little bit is the, uh, um, is the one for the, uh, the four time stamp approach and, you know, and how to do the maintenance on it. Okay, so you know, partial coverage of this, this matrix. And so again, you're, now you're gonna see the, uh, the, um, the madness behind that, uh, that example that we went through. What's important in, in, of, the, of the example uh, in the events that I chose. So what's important in doing this four time stamp uh, maintenance, so the maintenance of the data using the four time stamp approach, what you have to do is whenever you get in a new time slice of information, you have to look for four types of existing time slices. Okay, so I'm gonna explain to you just really high level how this, that processing works. And this is again, this is how the processing works behind the new ANSI ISO temporal extensions, okay? You get in a new time slice you may have an existing time slice, okay, which overlaps your valid end, right? So what would you do when, you, when that happens, right? You've got to logically delete this time slice. You've got to make a new time slice, which is this part of that old time slice, okay? And you've got to create this new time slice. Does that make sense, right? Because you always want at the current transaction time, right, the full, the full spectrum of data that you had here, right? We're only invalidating this portion of the existing time slice, okay? So this is how the algorithm works for maintaining the bitemporal data using the four timestamp approach, okay? So that's what you do when you run into this scenario. If you insert a new time slice and you find an existing time slice that overlaps your valid end, that's what you do. Another thing that may happen is you may have existing time slices that are fully bounded by you. So here's a new time slice. This is an existing time slice. It's, uh, it's fully bounded by him. So what do we need to do? Simple. Just logically delete that guy. He's been fully invalidated, right? That's all I need to do, okay? Third scenario of an existing time slice that you need to process, you have an existing time slice that overlaps your valid start. Okay, here's my valid start of my new time slice. What do I need to do? Logically delete this time slice, okay? Make a new time slice, which is th just this portion of it, okay? And then create this time slice. Last scenario, fourth scenario for existing time slices that you need to, uh, to process when you put in a new time slice. Here's my new time slice. I have an existing time slice that fully overlaps me. What do I do? Logically delete this guy, create one new time slice that isn't logically deleted, Two time slice, second time slice that is, uh, isn't logically deleted, and create a third one. That's the algorithm in a nutshell for what's behind that cell and that matrix that I gave you. Okay, and that what creates this data, which is easy, this bitemporal data, which is easily queryable without the uh, combinations of max and less than.